Summoning Italy. Chapter Number 26, Next Step. Written by Kat Katsu. Imperial Palace, Esterant, 8.07 p.m. Caios couldn't believe what he was about to tell Remil and Ludius. As quickly as it started, Italy managed to put down Luria in such a short time that it would have been apocalyptic for them. In just nine whole hours, Luria's armed forces were decimated, and the king along with some of his lackeys were arrested. He could only hope that the royal family had a sufficient dinner. Maybe they wouldn't be so rash with their reactions once he tells them the news. As he approached the throne room, a nearby guard opened it up for Caios as there, Ludius and Remil sat in their thrones. Ludius yawned before he spoke in boredom, direct to Caios. Didn't expect to see you so soon. Remil meanwhile simply crossed her arms, well, with you here I'm sure you've brought some news regarding the ongoing war in Rodinius. Any updates? Caios bowed and nodded. With two files in his hands, he approached the two royalties and handed the documents over as he cleared his throat, the war is over. Italy has defeated Luria. The two royalties looked to Caios in surprise, at each other, and then the files handed to their hands. They both read its contents as Remil scanned the words, her eyes could only get even more covered in dread, the war ended in. Nine hours. Much of Luria's soldiers killed or missing. Majority of its navy sunk, military-trained wyverns almost endangered. Hark arrested. Caios nodded, it seemed like the Italians used a precise knife rather than just swinging a huge axe. They put down just the military and caught Hark himself. There have been minimal civilian casualties as far as I've heard. Ludius rubbed his chin in amusement, all that power yet they limit themselves by a lot. Remil looked to Ludius and realizing that he was in that look of focus, she immediately changed the subject, so what happens to Luria then? Does Italy take over? Or does that other barbarian nation take over? Caios shook his head, well. Luria would lose its vassals and have a minimal military. And, apparently they'll be crowning someone new. A queen this time around. A queen? Ludia said, skeptical, that full king does not have any relatives, doesn't he? A child, your highness. We expect her coronation to be in a couple months, Kaio said. Luria will remain an independent nation as far as I'm concerned but will pay heavy reparations to Quartoin under Italy's watch. On paper it would seem that Luria, or even Rodinius as a whole is now in Italy's sphere of influence. Bothersome. I see. The emperor muttered, anything else? Uh, well. Italy was still waiting for us to permit them on the oil deals. But they have seen retracted them for an unknown reason, Caios explained. This is due to the stubbornness of the slaves and monopolies up north. They refuse to leave their lands behind. If Italy were to find out we engage in slavery, they certainly wouldn't react well. How annoying, well, try to find a way to get them back, Caios. A few nobles have been complaining that their fuel for their cars are slow to arrive and expensive, including mine, Ludius said with a frown. Caios nodded, yes, your majesty, but that's about it. I will update you of any new developments. Very well. You're dismissed, Ludius said. With that he watched Caios leave the throne room before the emperor sighed deeply, great, we lost our opportunity in Rodinius. Knowing them they'll probably try to contact the other barbarians in the sea. Remil crossed her arms, what about the war plans for Riem or Mal? Those still seem viable options, right? Sure but the problem is we chose Alteraz and Fen for a reason, they were tiny islands. We have strong navies but our land forces are still lacking. It will take some extra time until the preparations are done, he said with a frown. Well, let's hope the Italians wouldn't have a reason to look north, Remil said with a sigh. Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Rome, two days later. Bianca Lorenzo walked through the halls of the Foreign Affairs building as she held in her arms files of new nations. They have yet to meet around the continent and the seas. With the Prime Minister's intention of meeting them first beforehand, she tasked her ministry to research on them, mostly through talking with their Parpaldian peers about them. Bianca reached her office as she sighed. She spread the files evenly on her desk. Designated as maritime nations, Bianca decided that to describe them as barbaric was short-sighted. 
wholeheartedly, it would be wise to find a new term instead of such an insulting name such as barbaric. She reached her hand for the first. Fen Kingdom. A small island nation east of Falage with, nigh Japanese culture down to language and customs. She scanned it intently. How could such a nation be almost Earth-like in a way? Maybe it was a small island that got transferred? She then read the next file. Gahara Thiaki, another Japanese-like nation. Bianca took a mental note to ask any knowledgeable historian if there have been folklore of missing islands from Japan. Next was the Altaraz Kingdom. Protectorate of the Parpaldian Empire. A nation with culture reminiscent of the Arabic nations from attire to architecture. No hints of Islam as far as they knew. Could be a native nation of Alizia that happened to coincide with Arabic culture. Popular for their crystal mining. The Sio's Kingdom. Another island nation. Mix of European and Arabic medieval culture due to its location. A big bird watcher area apparently. Bianca then sighed softly as next she took the other files labeled as continental nations. Another term they coined for those on Falades yet somehow Parpaldia still regarded as barbarians. The Mal Kingdom, the Riem Kingdom. No republics anywhere at all. Bianca then reached another file. The Topa Kingdom. She then yawned and opened the file as she scanned its contents. A militaristic kingdom up north, populated mostly by elves and humans, it's a gate to the Gramius continent? Bianca then sat up in her seat. Home to the doors of the world, a continent of demons. Goblins? Ogres? The source of, it was where the emissaries of. Bianca then went wide-eyed. She then quickly spoke into her intercom, Leonardo, get me a car to the Prime Minister's office, please. Wait wait this is just crazy to process. So you're telling me that the country that the Romans fought alongside with still exists, and that the threat could still be possible? Giovanni asked, wide-eyed. First thing yes, second thing, we don't know yet. It says here that they manage a fortress called the Doors of the World but we're not sure if there is any true active threat, Bianca said as she kept her eyes on Giovanni. If you were to ask me, Prime Minister, I believe the Topa Kingdom should be high priority. I think we can meet with the maritime nations easily with our navy, but we should focus our best diplomat for Topa. Giovanni rubbed his chin, well I would approve that in a heartbeat. I haven't heard yet from the archaeologists in Quartoing, but from what I heard from Moretti, these were the guys who helped defeat some sort of demon king. It seems like that's our new priority then. Do what you must to establish contact with Topa. All right. Well speaking of Mr. Moretti, I'll need his assistance once more. This'll be the first time we're heading up north. Can't be too cautious now, can we? Bianca said as she stood up from the chair. Go ahead, I'm sure Moretti would be glad to help you out. With a nod, Bianca then walked out. Mana Communicator Office, Topa Kingdom, five days later. An elf woman entered the office with a little yawn as in her hand was a cup of special topan tea that always helped her through the day. Being a kingdom far up north, not to mention there being no significant threats for 10,000 years, the Topa Kingdom has always sort of been to the side of the grand scheme of things. Aside from Parpaldia demanding slaves, which is horrendous, there wasn't too much happening in their corner of the world. The elf communicator then sighed tiredly as she then sat down in her seat. It wasn't a bad job. Wait for nothing and well, keep waiting. She took a sip of her tea as she laid back in her seat. Another boring day for the Topa Kingdom, she thought. But then, she heard a noise. Come in come in, Topa Kingdom. The elf went wide-eyed and with a rush she sat up and spoke into the communicator, Oh. Um yes, this is Topa. Who is this? This is Alberto Rossi and I am speaking on the behalf of the Italian Republic. We are approaching Topan airspace onboard an iron flying machine and as such we request permission to enter. We are here on the behalf of my government to establish diplomatic ties. The gruff voice said. I will notify the king, please hold, she said. She then stood up and ran to another mana communicator this time within the castle as she spoke into the receiver. Your Majesty, we have an iron flying machine approaching. Onboard are diplomats from a nation called the Italian Republic. 
What shall be our response? We'll be allowing them in our airspace. Advise them that we will be sending wyverns as guides to burn Jen. An aide said through the mana communicator. Very well, she said. With that she switched back to the wider channel as she spoke into it. Mr. Rossi, the Topa Kingdom has officially acknowledged your arrival and has allowed you in our airspace. Please be advised we will send a squadron of wyverns to guide your flying machine. Acknowledged. Thank you, the voice said. With that the elven communicator walked off to another channel. This was the most work she's done in years and to say she disliked it would be lying. In the throne room meanwhile, King Rodo XVI sat there in contemplation. There have been rumors of a so-called new ally of Parpaldia that have appeared out of nowhere. Now they were heading here? The king sat there in worry before an aide looked at him, my king, what's the matter? Rodos looked to his aide as he sighed deeply, Italy's approaching us for diplomatic talks. I heard that they're an ally of Parpaldia aren't they? And they defeated Luria so easily as well. I'm sure they'll be demanding tribute, won't they? The aide then felt a bit more uneasy, maybe so but, we do not know their intentions yet, your majesty. All Rodos could do was sit in his throne impatiently. As Alberto looked out the window and watched the wyverns fly side by side with their helicopter, the man adjusted his suitcase in his arms. Along with Alessio, they were now designated as diplomats for potentially hazardous nations. The middle-aged man could only grumble at such a task, but the hazard seemed to be more from the environment this time around than a warmongering doctrine. Alberto didn't believe what he read at first. He didn't see himself as religious, even when he was younger and his mother would take him to church. But here they were, in a world where demons and gods exists. He supposed, God acknowledging, would be a more appropriate term. But Alberto didn't have time to think of religion. Right now he had an assignment to do. As the helicopter started to circle the city below them, Alberto could see that this was much more heavily fortified than even the capitals of Luria and Quartoin. As the stone buildings slowly grew taller the more they descended, Alberto adjusted his tie. On the ground was a fancy-looking elven man with a set of light armor. Alberto eyed him before the helicopter doors were eventually opened as the rotors died down. The man ahead of him had a smile as he spoke, Hello. Welcome to the Topa Kingdom. I'm Moros, head of foreign affairs. Alberto then plastered on his own smile as he reached out for a handshake to which Moros took, nice to meet you. I'm Alberto Rossi, and this Alessio Bianchi. We are diplomats for the Italian Republic. Thank you for entertaining us at such short notice. We would have messaged ahead but we are still working on our mana communicators. No problem at all, sir, Moros said. This was a diplomat from the Parpaldian ally of Italy, defeater of Luria. Better get on their good side, he thought. Follow me, the king himself would like to meet you. Alberto nodded. As he held his suitcase filled with his things, he looked up to see the grandeur castle. As fortified as Jinhark was, the Topan castle seemed to be even more heavily defended with multiple guards, watchtowers, and even wyverns circling the city. As he was lead inside, Alberto then looked to Alessio who had a cross around him. He didn't see the younger diplomat as religious either, if anything it was the first time he saw him wear a crucifix necklace, what's with the cross? Huh? Alessio looked to Alberto and then to the cross around him, oh you know, just in case. I know I know, different world and all, but you'll never know. HM, fair enough, Alberto said with a little sigh. Moros looked to the two curiously before he faced forward as the guards of the castle opened up the heavy doors. Ahead in the main hall, a line of knights all stood parallel to each other, their pikes in their hand as they were ready to defend the king. Whatever they were defending against, the topans were either ready, or afraid. Another set of heavy double doors were opened by the guards. Up ahead as he sat on the throne, King Rodo XVI then had a big friendly smile as he stood up with his arms open, Welcome to the Topa Kingdom, honored delegates. Moros kneeled for his king before he stood up as he spoke, Your Majesty, diplomats of Italy, Mr. Alberto Rossi and Alessio Bianchi. Rodos then stood from his throne and gave the two delegates a respectful nod. He then stepped down from his throne as he spoke, It is an absolute honor to meet you both. We have heard rumors of Luria's defeat in the hands of your nation. 
I can only wonder what military prowess you must all have. Um would you perhaps want some refreshments? Or um. Alberto and Alessio looked at each other and then to the jittery king. With that Alberto spoke, please, your majesty it truly is a compliment but we reassure you we're on friendly and equal grounds here. You can relax. Rodos kept his smile before he seemed to deflate as if he held a breath, okay, if you say so, Mr. Rossi. We don't usually get a lot of visitors, much less from an ally of the Parpaldian Empire. We don't see your nation as lesser, your majesty. We don't believe in the term barbarian countries, Alberto said with a more reassuring look. As long as we both treat each other with respect, we'll get along. Rodos had a look of genuine surprise, so did Moros. It was unheard of such a powerful nation to treat the so-called barbarian nations as equals. With a more fatherly smile now, Rodos nodded, that I can agree with, sir. Now then, shall we head off to a meeting room? Alberto nodded, we shall, your highness. With that, Alberto followed the two into a hallway. He could only wonder why the king seemed so nervous to meet them and so eager to please them. It seems like he'll find out soon enough. 